everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. And today you've got a double treat because you've got Jill Squared, Dr. Jill Krista, and I are here today. We love to laugh and joke about that. And we actually really genuinely like it. Well, hello, everybody. Oh, one Welcome second. Yeah. Episode of Dr. Jill Live. And today. <laughs> Echo. So, so funny. Okay. Well, everybody, let's, um, if you're live, you're witnessing the, the, the bloopers. <laughs> That's the way I'm going to start over. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm going to say a quick intro for the recording. So hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. And today you've got a double feature, double treat with Jill Squared. Dr. Jill Krista and I are here today. And as I said a moment ago, we genuinely love one another. We're just talking about collaborating in this world. And uh, it's really interesting because we have different training backgrounds, but we are so aligned in so many of the ways that we think about. And I just want to say publicly, Dr. Jill, that I always learn something from you every time I hear you. And it's so fun to be like a lot of people think, you know, we're both teachers in these realms. And so I go and lecture and I do podcasting. But the secret of it all is so often I actually learn a ton, like it's a total, yeah. right, total pleasure and joy when I'm getting to talk to people, because usually my uh, education is expanding. Um, and I'll just say one thing in particular, not too long ago, you did a mold. Um, uh, it was a weekend seminar that was fantastic. And one of the things you mentioned that I'm now sharing with my patients is the time inhalation. Yeah. So, oh, wonderful. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And before I introduce you, let's just really quick talk about that. So maybe I'll let you tell what what it is and how it relates to the mycotoxins, because I always have these people, I give them antifungal herbals or antifungal prescription sprays, because Mm -hmm. a lot of the colonization, as you and I know, is a big deal. It's almost like you take them all with you, right? And they're not getting better and not getting better. And like, why am I not getting better? And obviously, if you're colonized, you take it with you and that can produce mycotoxins and actually affect you away from the mold exposure. So- the solution is to treat that. But I was coming across people who would get very bad reactions. So go ahead and tell us just a little bit about that time inhalation and why it's a game changer. Yeah. I mean, this is, I got to say thank you to my teachers. I mean, you said, I always learn from you too. Mm -hmm. And everyone has a way of saying things that even if it's something that my, my brain, my thinking brain kind of conceptualized, I didn't own it, you know, until I hear some people say it. So I I just want to acknowledge back that you are one of my teachers too. Um, so my, my teachers in hydrotherapy taught me this in naturopathic school. It's using time, the herb or the essential oil. Um, you can u- use it in all different ways. It could be fresh, it could be dried, but taking a component of that time and adding it to boiling water and then tenting your head with just a good old flour sack, you know, a uh, towel and just doing the inhalation and I've seen this knock out Marcons. I've seen it knock out MRSA, COVID. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense because we, you know, our sinuses are caverns and caverns and caverns of them. So a spray can only get so far, whereas a vapor can get to all of those tissues. So it can get to those back crevices and things like that. So you basically just tent over it and you stay under there for five minutes, three minutes. You know, it kind of depends on what you your body can handle. You do want to close your eyes because it's a little stingy on the eyes. Um, but this is, it, you can do it multiple times a day for people who are really congested. And for people who get real congested when they go to bed at night, you can do it before you go to sleep and then you can breathe through the night. So it's yeah, just a it lovely, a wonderful patient. pearl. Yeah. And it's on YouTube. So if anyone's out there yep. and wants, just wants to see the video, I've literally yeah. been sending my patients that link um, <laughs> to do before. That's my son doing it. I was like, oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> Make a video because he was congested. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So thank you for those kinds of pearls that you're helping all of us with. Um, and now I'm going to go backwards and formally introduce you. So Dr. Jill Christ is a pioneering naturopathic doctor, best-selling author, devoted educator, and creative innovator. Her superpower is to make complex medical concepts simple and digestible for the average person. Her passion is to elevate the well-being of the planet by way of her inhabitants of um, her books and online courses support those wanting concrete steps to conquer health challenges. She focuses on design conditions that cause injury to the brain and nervous system, including mold, which is both of our loves and hates, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, pan, pandas, Lyme disease, and concussion. So again, the nice thing is we treat so many similar. It's really the, I always think the complex chronic illness that we see that people are at the end of their road and they've tried other things that are usually in our offices. And in my mind, it's always toxic load, infectious burden, and the interplay between those two, which is mold and Lyme a lot of times. Yeah. Right? And then you add the the triad of trauma, you know, and it's just like, even if you didn't come into it with trauma, the experience of it is traumatizing. So yeah, it's that. And and I know that, you know, you've 
That's what this is all about right here. Yes. This amazing book. <laughs> you're right. It's, you're right. About, it's so and I think in my personal journey. I mean, that's because I've been through mold. I have had head Lyme, you know, it's all under control, but that was part of my aha was my own experience realizing I did all the right stuff and I got to 80%. And then that last 20% was like elusive until I went inside, started to feel again, I was living above the neck in the analytical mind. And then I started somatically experiencing. And, and one of the things in the research of the book that I found, and I know you see this as well, we know that having mold exposure and the subsequent health issues is traumatic. So that's one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not a psychological trauma. Literally, there is data that shows the chemical inhalation on the HPA axis and our amygdala literally triggers a limbic response. So even if you're like emotionally totally connected and you have all these yeah. wonderful resources and you have friends and family and a therapist, you can still just chemical inhalation can trigger trauma um, physiologically. And that was a big aha for me because I realized 100% of our patients who have chronic complex illness have to in some way incorporate trauma healing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You said that so well. Thank you so much for bringing that up because people do think, you know, there, there can be that self-blame game that can start with this. You know, when you go down the why question, the why yeah. tunnel, um, and it's like, well, sometimes it's just, it is what happened to you. And it's time to just, you know, tell the body that you're safe again, but that's really hard to do when you have colonization, as you know, because that's continuing to our olfactory bulb. For those that are listening, it's one of the, it's our smell nerve from our brain. It's a really circuitous nerve. It kind of goes all the way around the whole inner part of the brain. And when you have mycotoxins, because they're fat soluble, they can just ride that olfactory nerve right up to the brain. That's one of the four places in our brain that has no blood brain barrier. So there's no barrier to it. So the more you're in that mold, the more of those toxins you take on, and that is going right through and around the whole limbic system. And that, you know, so you can be, like you said, the most balanced person and and it just trips this trigger of trauma that now you are the person who also has to deal with trauma that you're like, I don't, I don't have anything. I don't have any childhood. Right. Like I had a good childhood. I'm doing well. Yeah. My parents were amazing. <laughs> right. yeah. why, do, why do I have to deal with trauma? It's like, no, 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 the chemicals. So I love how you describe that, like chemical trauma. Yeah. Uh, you too. I love that you describe the nerve. And, and just for those listening, there's one particular person who follows, you know, some of the social media and always comments. He gets really angry when I talk about this because he's like, this is not a psychiatric diagnosis. And we're actually saying the opposite. We're saying exactly. this is not psychiatric at all. It's not all in your head. It's literally a chemical thing. So I think it's so freeing because it's not our fault. It's not like we're yeah. you know not well adjusted. It's literally this thing that we just have to deal with. <laughs> right. And it does need treatment. Yes. You know, I mean, that's, um, and, and there's the connection with the pandas pans is that those, when those mycotoxins go up into that limbic system, they're also creating enough inflammation and immune confusion that the brain chemist or the brain immune system, the microglia start to attack itself mm -hmm. because it's trying to clear that toxin. It's almost like it's trying to prevent those toxins from locking in and you get this autoimmune response that's causing brain attack in the basal ganglia, which is part of our limbic system. And so these kids live with constant fear, constant anxiety, torturous thoughts, intrusive thoughts, OCD, tics, you know, all of the whole confluence of symptoms has to do with that area of the brain being irritated. So mold is almost always in the picture of that okay. diagnosis. So that's what we want to talk about today is pan and pandas. Many people listening are really familiar and really educated and they know what that is. You kind of described it, but let's go back and give a framework for that parent listening or maybe teenager listening or maybe dad. Um, mm -hmm. What would this look like? In a, and typically this can be in adults too. Let's define what is it? And then what would it look like in someone coming to the clinic for you or I? Yeah. So the, they have different, so I get asked a lot, well, why are there two names? So there's pandas and pans. And I think that there should be a third category that is Lyme associated. So whether we call it plans, <laughs> like pediatric right. Lyme associated neuropsych. So pandas is pediatric autoimmune neuropsych condition associated with strep. That's the key with pandas is strep. Pans opens up that um, causal aspect to be other infections. And what I'm hoping that, you know, us in functional medicine, naturopathic medicine are saying, Hey, by the way, that's also toxins. That doesn't always have to be an infection. The infection is usually the last straw, but the toxins are the thing that build the camel back, you know, the straws on the camel's back. And then there are some infections like Lyme. And that's the case in, in my kids. Um, I, I have twins with pans 
And they're 23 now, but it all started when they're about three. And actually it started in the womb because I had Lyme and I gave it to them. So they never developed a normal immune system. They came into it with hypogamma globulinemia, which means low immunity. And so they had a more gradual onset with pandas and pans. It's an acute, abrupt change in the child with the plans or <laughs> the Lyme one or congenital infections like Bartonella, Babesia, that can be a more gradual onset. So I, I acknowledge in the book, I'm inappropriately using the term pans for my kids because there isn't a name for it, but the way that they look is similar. Yes. So the, the way, you know, the thing that started it is might be different things, but the way that it looks in the end is the same because we see the same changes in the brain and the basal ganglia. So while the clinical criteria are, they talk about things like OCD, tics, um, disordered eating, those kinds of things, changes in behavior, regression. When we pull parents and what they're usually bringing kids in for is separation, anxiety, fears. Um, we might see urinary frequency, bedwetting, some of that stuff, regression for sure. Um, handwriting changes, um, behavioral changes, social changes. So we may not see necessarily OCD in the way you'd see it in an adult, like frequent hand washing. You may see it. It's mm -hmm. very much part of these conditions, but OCD in a kid can look kind of different yeah. um, because they're acting through their compulsion is a behavior. Their yeah. obsession is this thought mm -hmm. and they won't, they don't necessarily have the insight like an adult would that this is not a normal way of thinking. Like yeah. to think that maybe you're not my parent, maybe an imposter stepped into you. That's, that's something that an adult would be like, wow, I'm, I'm not really sure what that thinking is, but you know, I'm going to avoid that person. But when it's a child and they have no choice, yes. then they're going to have to act out that intrusive thought through a compulsion. Yeah. And that can be acting out through fears. So fears is a huge part of this, which makes sense when we talk about the location in the brain, you know, it's limbic. So of course they're going to be have fears. Yeah. What a great way to explain it because you're right. The OCD in children doesn't always present like we would think because mm -hmm. they're in their brain, you know, like this thought is that when we talk about rumination or intrusive thoughts is this like a record player round and around and around. And so inside they may be like, oh my gosh, I got to close that door. I got to check the door. I got to, or I'm, uh, so this, this may not be my parent or whatever kind of thing or, mm -hmm. um, or, and then I also find in a lot of my, um, adult, you know, moms and dads that bring in their children is the aggressive behaviors. And some of these things that are very out of character. Do you want to describe a little bit of how that can present? Cause I find that for that, the poor parent is also traumatized because they're dealing with this. They love their child. They want to be there for them. And their child is literally beating them up. Sometimes even breaking bones and things. And I let's know. talk a little about that to normalize for parents experience, because this is so, I have such deep compassion for both the parent and the child. Right. I know. Yeah, this is, um, we, we can see aggression a lot, especially when there's Bartonella mm -hmm. and the, as part of that picture, because aggression, anger, irritability, that's kind of part of the Bartonella picture. Mm -hmm. And I think that just has to do with a certain kind of chemicals or cytokines that the Bartonella induces in that brain and the limbic system. But it's quite common to see that. Mm -hmm. And the way that I think of it as like a cornered animal, yeah. you know, so you have, again, a child who has no choice who has little agency in their, in their daily existence. And if you have a parent who's a strep carrier, no matter what condition you have, if it's pandas, pans, or Lyme, strep then becomes kryptonite. No matter if it wasn't strep that started it, strep can be the kryptonite for them because it's the dominant respiratory pathogen. And lots of people are walking around being strep carriers because we have, you know, glyphosate and messed up guts and mm -hmm. all those things. So if you have a parent or a sibling or a pet or something like that, that is a carrier of something that is agitating that immune system, my belief is that there are pheromones and I'm finding more and more data as I'm creating, I have a, a practitioner training course on pandas and pans. I'm finding these evidence of these pheromones that can be mosquito attractors, mm -hmm. that can be tick attractors. Mm -hmm. wow. So of course, why wouldn't it also be something that's communicating to a sick kid through the smell nerve? that's not safe, stay away from that person. But then if they're forced to be with the person, do things that they just don't have energy for, be with the pet who maybe is a Bartonella carrier, then it's cornered animal time. So then it's an acting out toward the parent or the sibling or the pet or those kinds of things. Wow. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. paying attention to the behaviors mm -hmm. tells you everything about what's going on with that kid. So if it's repeated hand-washing, I always tell the family, is that child having to wash hands for all of you? 
because maybe you guys are all the ones that are carrying the germs that are hard on that kid. And so they're having to do all of it for you. And it's amazing when the family starts washing hands, cleaning doorknobs, cleaning countertops, that repeated hand washing goes away. Wow. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Wow. That's brilliant. Just like always, you just like my job. I'm like, that makes so much sense. It yeah. makes so much sense. Um, interesting story. I was at the farmer's market maybe a month or two ago with a real good friend of mine who's a neuropsychologist. And we all of a sudden there's this commotion as we walked out to our cars and there was a police van and there was a couple of people standing there. And my friend is such a compassionate, beautiful soul. She often goes towards that because she's a neuropsychologist and she has the ability <laughs> to kind of reach in and like help. I wasn't out. I, I ended up leaving. But later I heard there was this young man about 17, 18 and sister and mother. And he had bitten his sister, like taking a chunk of flesh out of her arm. And mother was like a little bit bruised. I mean, he was very violent. So the police were like, and they, the beautiful thing was in our city of Boulder, like this, the policemen were like giving him a bear hug and like holding him down, but with such kindness and compassion, like she came on it and she said, Jill, I cannot believe our police force, how compassion and they must have had some training because otherwise you would just like handcuff this boy and like you know take him off right. it was total like giving safety through bodily like 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 mm-hmm. a, a blanket weighted blanket right and then the mom and the sister were there and of course they were they knew this boy and they knew and it was clearly like as we talk and later after I heard this from her I'm like oh that sounds like a pan pandas case doesn't yeah. it like yeah or, or I mean it could have been drugs or psychiatric. Or Lyme. Yeah. yeah, he was young enough that, and it was one of those things where the mother and daughter explained they dealt with this frequently, like it wasn't uncommon. And they both, of course, loved him, but they were also getting hurt in the process. And it just reminded me how that can certainly, of course, there could have been other things involved, but it was a fairly young person with a family that knew that this behavior was common. And what I loved was that the police in our city were so kind and compassionate because somehow they must have understood that this wasn't just a bad behavior. Um, and then my friend went in there and actually started to explain and was helping the mother and daughter deal with their trauma and but in my mind it's like that would be exactly how a pan or pandas could present in public right yeah because then in public if if your boundaries are down so mm-hmm. that's how that's what starts this in the first place is their immune system is down yeah. they didn't they didn't have what they needed to deal with the last infection and then you put them into a public place so first of all their fears are up yeah. their sensory system they are like tuned in to everything is going to harm me and you put them in a public place. And then if there are any kind of infections or toxins, it can just, you know, tip over the, we talk about the toxin cup, you know, each of us has a different sized cup that we can handle those toxins and you fill up, you fill up the cup or the bucket, and then it starts to spill over. Well, spill over in these kids case activates microglia in the brain, which is our immune system, the resident immune system of the brain. I call them monkeys. So hashtag monkeys in the mind. And when they're mad, they not only scream, they recruit other monkeys to get mad and they start flinging poop. So yeah. cytokines like crazy. Uh-huh. And that can just totally short out a brain. And a lot of times these kids don't remember their the, the acting out of it. So it's as traumatizing to the family who's receiving this. And then the kid who snaps back in once that cytokine storm rushes through the brain and they see the result of their behavior or their action. And it's horrible. Then that starts the self-blame thing. And none of this has to be happening. It's Mm. all treatable. Yeah. That's why I wrote the book. (laughs) I love it, Dr. Jill. And and this reminds me again, a patient I had in the clinic, he was about uh, seventh grade and is in same exact kind of behaviors. And in the clinic in front of me, he would cry 
because he knew he had his mother and his mother loved him and he loved his mother. And he was like realizing, and of course in the clinic at the moment when he's, he's, he's stable, the cytokines are down and I could see this interplay. And I like had such deep compassion for both the mother and the son, because he was realizing the extent of his behavior. He didn't want to be that way. He's so, what you see, right? Like, of course. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to act that way. Nobody does. No one would. Right. Right. And then so, and um, harm the people that you love and that love you. And yeah. And so, I just, yeah, there's so much we can do. We have mm-hmm. so many tools for these kids. Yeah, so let's say, so there's a lot of clinicians who listen to us as well. And what would you uh, suspect? So we kind of got a framework of what a parent might see in the kids and the OCD behaviors or the other things that might present like OCD. Um, what about a clinician? What questions might they want to ask? Um, what way would they maybe know that this could be on the differential? Yeah, I think, again, I think I hope that people will see the clinical criteria and then think a little bit broader than that. And remember, this is a clinical diagnosis. So you don't have to have a positive test of any kind. Tests are helpful when you say, I'm not really sure the, you know, the complete target or the, you know, the things that contributed to this. It's great to test so that you have that information. But basically, if you're seeing the things that fall into that clinical criteria of like we talked about OCD, tics, um, eating restriction or eating changes, regression, anger, irritability, um, bedwetting, urinary frequency is a big part of this, even though it didn't make the clinical criteria Mm. and fears, 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 and separation anxiety. And that may not be to a person that may be to their room Mm -hmm. or their bed or their bathroom or their toilet. We have some kids who don't want to leave the toilet. And to me, I'm like, well, then we already know what's going on with them. Their microbiome is a mess and we need to go there. You know, they're telling us this is a potty problem. (laughs) Yeah. So if you're seeing that kind of pattern and to be classic, it would be an acute abrupt change from a completely normal kid. Boom. And then something happened and it seems like the kid was stolen overnight. So to speak, but if it doesn't have the acute yeah. Remember, there's this other third diagnosis category that we need to start defining mm-hmm. that is the gradual onset from congenital or from increasing environmental toxin load. Um, so congenital infections, but also congenital toxins, because we can give mycotoxins. Um, but this, you know, gradual environmental load, and I know you, you know, raised in farmland, yes. you got all kinds mm-hmm. of that, you know. <laughs> I was thinking of you this morning. I just, they, the plane came over my house. He turns over my house and I'm just like, oh yeah. Yeah. We were talking to Jill today. (laughs) And interesting, I talked to my mom about this too. I mean, she had some chronic fatigue or migraines and looking back, I'm sure in utero, like there was a huge, I don't know what percentage, but same as, as you're mentioning, I think that that, that was something we actually don't talk about enough. Um, and the year that I got diagnosed with breast cancer, which is over 20 years ago now, 2001, that was the Canada study on cord blood that showed out of the womb, babies were being tested and they had over 200 toxic chemicals in the cord blood. And so this is plus 20 years later, it's only got to be worse than that. And that's exactly. chemicals, not infections, right? Right, right. Um, yeah. Not even adding in those infections. Yeah. yeah. So if, if clinicians are seeing that, just Remember that, you know, see the clinical criteria, open that up a little bit to, you know, the fears are definitely ever present. Separation anxiety is there. Urinary frequency. We see generalized abdominal pain, which again, makes sense when we think about the toxins and the infection load. We see that with a lot of conditions that express those. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the abruptness they may not have, but that's the classic case is going to be an abrupt overnight onset. So if it's not abrupt overnight, that kind of informs you that this is probably not a strep induced thing that now we go looking for different types of infections to induce it. Um, a flu is very common to be the thing that starts it. Mono in a teenager is a very common thing because the herpes family, which mono is in the herpes family, as you know, I'm just sharing yes. with others, um, that loves the nerves. So that's going to be something that is a common neurological trigger for these kids and COVID. Now that we have COVID, it's right in the vagus nerve. It can get right into the brain through the vagus nerve. It can, you know, so that's become another big factor for these kids. Mm -hmm. Um, So if a clinician is seeing those, those might be the things that they're looking at. And parents will, when you say, well, it's not abrupt. um, When you go back and you look, there was probably an abrupt onset, but it looked, the kid covered it up. So Mm -hmm. it might be like a classic Lyme one is if there's a spiral to the tick, 
then you know there's a Borrelia somewhere in there in my clinical experience. Mm -hmm. So if it's like this or, you know, and it just might be something that looks cute and they may work that because the, the obsession builds, 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 builds in their brain. And then it's like, they need to discharge it. Mm -hmm. So they might adjust their chair and do this. And you're just yeah. like, oh, so full of energy and, yeah. you know, <laughs> or jumping when they stand up, jumping three times or ticks like that it might be a vocal tick. And so they might start humming and you're like, oh, this kid loves to sing and hum. So it can look very mild and still be the autoimmune, you know, the whole inflammation thing going on. And if we can catch it when it's mild, if we can raise awareness that these are things that are unusual, you know, to have yes. a kid have to jump three times when they stand up, that's neurological inflammation. Let's catch it now. Mm -hmm. Then you don't have to have the kid that ends up biting his sister at the farmer's market. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good overview, clear for I think clinicians. So then, obviously, we have to look for infections and stuff. But what would you, what would uh, the clinician go about as far as? And I want to mention you have a course, so we'll be sure and link that up. So if you want to know more, it's in the book, A Light in the Dark, and is it? It's a Light in the Dark for okay. Pain and Pandas by mm -hmm. Dr. Jill Krista. So be sure and yeah. check that out, and we'll link up to all your courses and stuff. But um, where would we start as far as um, workup? I'm sure the gut's involved. And then where would you start as far as treatment? So let's take us through those kind of basics. Yeah. So because strep is such a player, um, we definitely want to assess for their reaction to strep. The key is though, there are kids who, because they're immune deficient, don't mm -hmm. test well on antibody-based tests. <laughs> so yes. just know that there are seronegative Mm -hmm. pandas positive kids. Yes. So meaning that their blood can be completely normal and they can still have pandas or pans. Um, but I think strep is a really good thing to assess at first. And that would be the whole family because there can be strep carriers. So usually the kid who has the pandas or pans, remember strep is important once it starts because it's the dominant pathogen and strep is so wily. We, just because you had strep before. So one strep strain immunity does not confer immunity to any other strep strain wow. and strep has all of these endotoxins that are unique to that strain so a different strep experience mm -hmm. can induce different types of symptoms wow. so that's where you get the kid who moved from urinary frequency to ticks to fears and you're just like you know what is it well it can still be strep every single time because the endotoxins are so different right. um, so i would assess throat culture, what we find with these kids um, and with strep in general, strep, the antibodies are much more complex than we thought. So a rapid strep, if it's positive, it's positive. Yeah. It's negative, still follow up with the culture because the culture is needed in these cases. So that means the kid and the family, mm -hmm. don't worry about pets because strep is a, is a human pathogen, but pets can carry it from a sick family member to another family member through licks and, you know, through saliva. Exactly. So if you have a family member with a strep infection on their skin or something like that, or has been kissing the dog and then the dog goes over and kisses the kid with pandas, that's going to flare the kid. Okay. So we typically see in a family, the kid with pandas, the strep is long gone, but someone in the family is still positive Got or it. they have strep on their bottom. Perianal strep is a very common hidden cause. And then the child is just continuously auto-toxing themselves every time they go to the bathroom or they might, you know, itch their bottom because strep on the bottom is kind of irritating and sore. So while they're sleeping, they may touch that and then touch their mouth. And that's how that they can get strep in their tonsils again. So cases of, there's a lot of discussion of whether you, you give these kids tonsillectomies or not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a lot we can treat that with, but if we've done all the perfect things and there's, we've for sure cleared perianal strep with a culture not with a rapid, um, then they may benefit from tonsillectomy, but that's a, that's a, a clinician, clinician and um, family decision. But I've had many, many cases where they were slated for tonsillectomy. And I said, let's just, let's just get started on some stuff and see. And they didn't have to have the tonsils removed. So, you know, but there are cases where we do, and it really helps the kid. Um, so then ASO and streptozyme, those would be some blood tests that we would see. Uh, anti DNA B, those are kind of like the, I've had strep and I'm having a bad reaction to strep kind mm -hmm. of labs. Those are great to run mm -hmm. um, to, for classic pandas. I'm finding the Cunningham panel fits yes. that classic pandas better. That's very expensive test. So if it's something where you're having a hard time convincing 
family members, teachers to, to do a special learning plan or something like that, and you need something on paper, mm -hmm. that's one to use for a classic pandas case. I've seen it miss pans and mm -hmm. plans or whatever the line one is. <laughs> yeah. So the strep picture you need to get really clear on for the kid and the whole family. And you would do that regardless of mold or Lyme, because that's such a big trigger, even in the underlying toxicity and other infections, right? So strep yep. to take care of that, if that's present, that makes sense. What about, this is an interesting thing with GBS positive mothers. So group beta strep is real common. They test every woman now with pregnancy and treat them. Is that a strain? And could a baby coming out of the vaginal cavity through birth get strep? So we don't have any studies, but those treating pandas and pans say, yes, absolutely. There's a correlation. So mm -hmm. moms who are GBH, <laughs> group B, strep yeah. um, positive, definitely had higher rates of having um, something neuro atypical happening with, with the kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great question. That gets missed uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, just thinking about because in utero, all these things are actually um, interesting. I was one of those five year olds with the tonsils removed because I, I was so, so I couldn't breathe. I was foaming at them like it was so bad, completely obstructing. And of course, now in hindsight, I have an immune deficiency. I probably did from birth. And so all this stuff is relative. And I did. I know so many people, it's like in the parents, a lot of times it's the parents that are like, or mom usually, mm -hmm. like, yeah. oh my gosh, could I have had that? Do I have uh -huh. this? You know, yeah, and like, exactly. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in hindsight. Um, so then treatment, right? Um, obviously, what I love about you is you always bring a lot of really natural pearls that I wouldn't have known because I wasn't taught in allopathic medicine. Right. And I'm sure you start there. So how would you start? And then obviously, if it gets severe, what would you go to for a prescription? Yeah, so the I, I wanted to, to put my core 10 things that I use with most pandas pans patients in my book. And I thought, oh, gosh, think back when my kids were sick. 10 things, I would read that and throw the book against the wall. Yeah. Again. <laughs> so, <true>. You're right. <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay, discipline yourself, Jill. Uh -huh. discipline yourself. So I came up with the core four, four awesome. things. So four basic things that we need to make sure we're paying attention to. Number one is tame the flame because we can't, anything else that we do is going to poke the bear and that's going to cause more flame. So taming the flame. Second is beat the bugs. Third is regulate immunity. So we need that immune modulation. And the four is guard the gates. So if we're not stopping the toxins and, you know, if we don't get them out of mold, yeah, they're not going to get better. So we have to do something to guard the gates, which would be, you know, basically I have the gates are the nasal gate, the throat gate, you know, just kind of thinking about all of the ways that the body can be exposed and then, you know, environmental exposures. Um, so tame the flame are going to be things that are reducing inflammation in general that are specific to the basal ganglia, like pro-resolving mediators. It's a wonderful, it, I think of it as like coating over a frayed nerve, you know? So it just copes things yeah. um, because mold is often in the picture and there's often a histamine problem. While I would love to use all whole fish oil, some of these kids have histamine mm -hmm. issues and can't tolerate that. So we just use the pro-resolving mediators, which are very targeted, I, I describe it to my parents. It's the most anti-inflammatory part of a fish oil that usually doesn't induce histamine. Um, fever. I food. want to just say, I love that because I am oh, the same yeah. way. It's my number one. I so often use that instead of fish oils, even in adults. And yeah. it is profound and it's anti-prostaglandin. So it's kind of anti-mast cell by nature. Yeah. Yeah. So it calms that part down. So in the tame the flame category, I kind of have like the general anti-inflammatories and then the mast cell managers. Mm -hmm. And then if you need to, obviously, you know, NSAIDs, yeah. I'm a huge fan because it can get a kid out of a crisis. Like that kid at the farmer's market. Yeah. I put him on, you know, my, my get out of jail free card yeah. is feverfew and combine it with naproxen or, or ibuprofen. Amazing. And, you know, just give them two weeks of a pharmaceutical yeah. grade dose of that. And you can really calm things down and it gives you that open window to start to play with the other things. Yeah. Um, so like rosemary, feverfew, um, these are beautiful plants for getting the flame down. And then our mast cell managers that we're very familiar with, you know, I'll, uh, one of my favorites is nettles because it does both antihistamine part, it blocks histamine receptors, but it stabilizes the mast cells. Um, and the funniest thing is I didn't even remember to put it in my book. Oh. <laughs> That's what I, I do. Know, you look like later. You're like, oh yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, I got to get the data about PEA, and I got to talk right. about DO and all the, and just like the stuff yeah. that you use every day. I did that in my mold book. I didn't talk about yeah. phosphatidylcholine. I was just like, oh, oh yeah, that's oh, oh, okay. Next book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Next edition. Yeah. 
And then beat the bugs, yeah, I kind of have four categories in there. One category is called the botanical avatars, which mm -hmm. are my favorite thing to talk about ever. Yeah. Um, an avatar is like an ideal. So mm -hmm. it basically, these are plants that are not only anti-strep, but they hit all the other mechanisms wow. that are going on with the kid, including balancing brain chemistry. So we're finding in the most recent studies, these cholinergic interneurons. So the communication between the neurons that use acetylcholine to communicate, these are getting destroyed in the in the process. So there's something happening there at that neuron. So if we can find these botanical plants that address strep, reduce neuroinflammation, have some action on the cholinergic interneuron, address the gut, address the kidneys and the urinary tract that is, you know, this frequency, um, reduce pain, because these kids live with a lot of central mediated pain, which means pain that starts in the brain, upregulating pain. Um, boy, these, these plants are just beautiful. So things like Chinese skullcap, Oregon grape root, bacopa, um, and they all kind of have their separate thing that they do. So in my book, I talk about the personality of the plant. So you can look at the personality of a kid. Like, are they really, like you talked about really boggy, swampy, uh -huh. you know, then yeah. we would go for the things that are from a swamp, you know, that, that love to live there because they're coming with that knowledge. Yeah. And that wisdom. yeah. So the, I, that's the foundation of pretty much every formula I do for a kid, I pick a botanical avatar or two that, you yeah. know, matches you them. And then that's the foundation. And then we add in the other things, you know, the things that reduce inflammation, the things that are maybe, so part, the other part of beat the bugs is finding things that are anti the bug you think you're dealing with. So if it was mono that started it for a teenager, we would want to make sure to put in things like licorice that would have some activity against that particular virus. Oh. Yeah. And then pharmaceuticals. I mean, I think probably the best tool in my entire book <laughs> is available to everybody. If you want to go to my website, it's a medication compatibility chart, because that's what I heard a lot from parents when I was working with them is I'm scared to do this with the Augmentin, or yeah. I'm scared to do this with the mm -hmm. serotonin drug. Mm -hmm. Can this be done at the same time? Yeah. So I just created a chart that shows what is safe. So it's all the natural stuff that we do for Panda Pans on the left side and not all of them, but the things I talk right. about in the book and then the medications across the top and you can just go and find, you know, Brilliant. is that okay to do? Because I thought I'm just going to answer those questions for people. We don't have data on everything, yeah. Um, but the main that is thing so know, important. I love, <laughs> yeah. You know, and then we, stuff. we, I just say to parents, pay attention to the ones that have a big mark. No, yes. you know, yes. <laughs> and pretty much everything else. I feel very comfortable as a practitioner doing combining and have for two decades. So, so yeah. I want to go on to the next two steps, but I just want to mention real quick, you mentioned cholinergic neurons. So there's a study that just came out recently on post COVID long COVID symptoms using nicotine. Yes. Well, you probably know nicotine is an acetylcholine receptor. And we know with, from old studies on ulcerative colitis, and it was always a question. People were like, why in the world would nicotine work? Well, it hits acetylcholine receptors. No wonder. Now I'm not going recommending for pain and pandas kid, you have nicotine or for most people you give a lot of nicotine, but I'm using it, it sense, right. And it actually is right in align with what you're saying is that when they're blocked or affected or inflamed or infected, um, those cholinergic are all about our brain and our executive function. And it really is a big deal. And so to me, it was like, no wonder nicotine works in long COVID sometimes, right? This right. I think you, you had even posted about microdosing and being really careful about doses, which I agree with. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I don't shy away from doing this with kids. I, I prefer to use whole plants. So I'm yeah. using tobacco tincture yeah. and we have an, um, an amount of how much nicotine per yeah. mill it is. Yeah. And so we can be really safe. Yes. Um, but the, the key is that, that cholinergic interneuron anywhere where acetylcholine can bind it's nicotinic acetylcholine yeah. receptors it has really high affinity for that. And it's going to bump spike protein off. Uh, so you want yes. to make sure that you have something that's going to degrade that spike protein, or you could put the kid into a little bit of a hypercoagulable state. So that's when we're using enzymes, mm -hmm. you know, just to make sure that we're breaking down that, that like lumbrokinase, spike. natokinase, serapeptase, all the above. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Brilliant. And yeah, if the kid yeah, doesn't tolerate that. those, we will just do like eat the pop pain and the bromelain yummy little treats, yep. you know, just get some or raw pineapple yeah. or, you know, something. <laughs> so, because um, I have, I made that mistake of just like, Oh, nicotine has high affinity. Yeah. And then, you know, I ended up with patients who were, you know, they were like a, a kid mm -hmm. who has babesia kind of has that purpley yes. 
um, nails and they would come in and they were just purple. I'm like, oh my goodness. Oh we wait, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Vitamin E, enzyme, yeah. let's go. Yes. Yeah. Oh, brilliant, brilliant pearl, um, as always. So those are the first two steps. Then what are the last? The yeah. last week? So regulating immunity, of course, this is going to be no surprise to you, is gut. You know, we've got to get the gut going. We have to increase vitamin D. One thing we know about mycotoxins is they downregulate the vitamin D receptor in the kidneys and the intestines. So people need to re-upregulate that. And the way you do that is to flood the body with vitamin D for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So for about a three month time, I want them between 60 and 90 nanograms per milliliter of vitamin D OH yeah. um, so that we can get those receptors upregulated again. It's similar to how we use naltrexone. Mm -hmm. um, and naltrexone is also part of that. Peptides are very useful in that category. And um, I am in love right now is something new that I've learned about, which is postbiotics. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I just, I, you probably already on top of this, but I just think it's so brilliant. It's basically just sterilized poop. Cause how are, how are we to know? It's like an FMT, yeah. you know, fecal yeah. microbiota transplant that you can take orally. Mm -hmm. And then we're not picking and choosing, you know, gee, I wonder what strain or yeah. peptide or nucleotide or bile acid that this gut needs they're getting all of it and the body can choose what it wants. And so I'm seeing really good results from that, but you do have to sprinkle it in at first because people are getting die off. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So, it's strong. Yeah. It's helpful, right? Exactly. And the last yeah. step is, so that's the last step, guard the gates. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we're guarding the, the nasal gate because that is the area of colonization it kind of circles back to where we started um, the dental gate. So there are certain things, you know, these kids end up with terrible because their fears, <laughs> they get behind on dental cleanings and can end up with a lot of dental stuff. So just simple things like chewing xylitol gum. There was a study, they had the kids chew xylitol gum for five minutes after every meal. And, you know, I think it was actually even two meals a day. And they showed a dramatic reduction of strep mutans wow. and a dramatic reduction of dental caries. So I'm like, what kid wouldn't like that? Yeah. Prescription? You know, exactly. did you chew your gum? You know, yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the throat, you know, using things like colloidal silver on the throat for sprays, propolis, those kinds of things have been shown to be really, really beneficial. And then environmental, we just want to make sure that we're the environmental gate is both infections. So mm -hmm. using pre-treated clothing, if you're in a tick area, using tick tubes, if you have a yard that where your kid is um, playing, Dr. Alexis Chesney just um, presented that for families that are using this year after year, their tick population is going down to where they're not having any troubles with it. So there's a lot of preventive things that we could be doing that are non-toxic. Yeah. And then of course, mold, 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 make sure you're assessing for mold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. And that's the book in a nutshell. I know it's amazing. So be sure and grab your copy. If you're listening and you want to get more, because this is so common. And probably if you're listening, some of you are like, oh, I wonder, and you're thinking about your child or maybe a uh, nephew or niece or someone in your family or someone that you know of, um, because this is actually way more common than it's, um, it's, I mean, it was, I remember like even in medical school, it was barely talked about. And now it's just like mold, right? These things are actually really common. And because of the increasing toxic load and infectious burden, it's just, um, way, way more common. Right. Um, personal, you went through this with your kiddos and obviously, yeah out healthy, but what was the biggest lesson or insight? Like if you could go back to yourself as an early mom, what would you tell yourself as an early mom with all that you've been through and, and, you know, come out with healthy kiddos through this and a book and the knowledge? Uh, I think for me, I knew something wasn't right, but I couldn't, I wasn't getting believed. So it's very similar to the mold thing. And as the behavior started to go up, I was doing this whole circus act to keep everybody normal. And I had a ton of tools. That was one thing I learned was like, okay, this problem is, is that the dopamine receptors are getting destroyed. So these kids are swimming in dopamine. So if I use herbs that are dopaminergic, my kids had an opposite reaction to those things. So like passion flower, lemon balm, um, all these things that we would typically think are going to calm them down, they would go yeah. the other way. And I couldn't understand what was going on. Um, so anyway, as the behaviors were going on and I'm doing this circus act of, you know, all using all my tools and I had a lot of support, you can start to think of your world because it does get a little smaller mm -hmm. because people don't necessarily feel comfortable around the behaviors. You can start to feel like smaller means less support. So mm -hmm. I want people to rewrite that false belief. You can have a small, hugely supportive 
environment around you and you can build that what I call the dream team you know you get your people around you that understand your kid don't judge you as a parent are part of the solution don't mind getting a throat culture just yeah. to say you know oh they kind of flared when they were with you do you mind if your kid gets yeah. a throat culture so we can kind of see you know so some of those things um they get complicated interpersonal things that happen but trust yourself you know your kid better than anyone. And if you have a doctor that is not on board, move immediately because it's going to add trauma to your kid and to you. Yeah. What brilliant wisdom, because again, whether you're dealing with a child with pain or pandas or yourself with mold or Lyme disease or any of the things that we talk about every day on this podcast and in mm-hmm. both of our offices, it is one of the biggest traumas I see is what you just spoke of. And that's you, in fact, even I have that. I mean, I've been through my Crohn's doc, doctor was like, oh, diet has nothing to do with this or, oh, it's all in your head on the mold. And I actually try to avoid doctors <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, but there is that piece of like what you just said that if we leave our listeners with one thing, it's like in your heart as a mother or as a person of a patient in your own body, you know, your body, your system, you were born with more than anyone else. And there's an intuition and an innate wisdom that is always giving you feedback. And usually it is, I would say nearly 100% of the time it is right on the money, but we suppress it because our mind's like, oh, that's silly. That's stupid. I'm overreacting. Right. So I just I'm going to inconvenience yeah. other people. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I really, really love that you emphasize that. And especially in these cases, because the parents are wanting so bad to help their children and they are overwhelmed and exhausted. And, uh, and then even doubting when the parents like, or the, um, um, I remember, I'm just going to tell you another little story. Um, my older brother, when he was very young, he was biting other children, very young, you know, and like back, I'm like, I bet my older brother had some brain inflammation. He's fine now. And I, if he listens to this, which he probably does, he's amazing. He's brilliant. But looking back, just like me with my tonsils, right. We both had these things going on. And I remember my mom actually went to get some help with a doctor or someone else. And they were like, oh, it's, you're a poor mother. Like they literally criticized her motherhood. And she never went back. Right. Yeah. And never got yeah. the help. And I look back, I'm like, I got oh, that. Yeah. I got, you know, um, are you sure you're, you're getting enough sleep to be patient with your kids, you know, kind of insinuating <laughs> I'm beating on my children. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I just, yeah. that as doctors, we have to be very careful what we project out there, yeah. you know, and, and trust our patients. I feel like that's the unique thing about us having enough time with our patients, we can really be present with them. And that's just not available to a lot of doctors. So they get compassion fatigue, they get burned out Mm -hmm. and they're not bringing their best to that situation too. So yeah, I just feel so grateful for the way that I get to do the work I do. Yeah. Yeah, Me too. too. (laughs) So if you're listening, be sure and grab a copy of a light in the dark by Jill Krista. That's out. Um, When did it come out, Jill? November. Yeah. November last year. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Now for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And we will link to your courses and of course to the book and everything. And as always, thank you not only just for being here and sharing your wealth of knowledge, but also just for the compassion you bring and the, you, you have such a brilliant way of taking very complex topics and making them simple and bite-sized and understandable. And I'm sure those listening can um, say amen to that. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. I put a lot of intention into that. So that means a lot. Thank you. Especially yeah. coming from a master communicator. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be back because Jill Square is not going anywhere, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for your time thank today. You so. Bye-bye.